Thank you, everybody, for taking time out uh, and, and, and joining us. Um, this is Vichal Munton's first uh, ever study group online like this. And it looks like somebody is constantly trying to uh, contact us. Um, so effectively, what I wanted to do was spend the next 60 minutes uh, going through uh, the, the, the topic. Uh, and the topic is Ittiasa. Um, with, with Professor Baladendra Dhara, and we can call him Balu for this uh, study group. Um, so effectively, the, the basic, I'm gonna get straight into it, so, so we won't really do too much of an intro and, and all the formalities, if that's okay with everyone. Um, what I want to do is get straight into it and um, spend the next 60 minutes discussing Ithyasa and particularly uh, Balu's uh, uh, ideas behind it and its foundational ideas behind it. Um, off the back of which, I would like to be in a position in the next hour so that we have explored the topic uh, to a degree where we can confidently um, articulate um, what we believe to be history, what we believe to be Itiasa, and, and effectively where the differences lie, if indeed there are any. Um, I would like us to be open, uh, critical, um, and um, you know, be able to ask questions as and when uh, you feel appropriate. Um, what I think would be a good idea is if we literally um, went round. So I'll say your name, and if you can just give maybe a quick 30 seconds or a minute uh, um, uh, to, uh, 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 and give us your understanding of what you think Ityasa and history is and, and, and what where basically you think your understanding lies at the moment. Um, and then that would give Balu a good idea as to his audience uh, and effectively how in the you may be, <laughs> or not. <laughs> so, so uh, uh, Yadro, can I come with you first? Uh, yes. So you just give us a quick quick insight into what you believe Kiasa and history is and the differences, if any. Sure. Uh, so, namaste. Uh, my name is uh, Yadro Shah. Uh, I'm currently the national president of NHSF UK, so that's National Hindu Students Forum in the UK. Uh, in terms of my understanding of Itihas, um, I suppose it is a, a collection of opinions and views um, of past events. Um, uh, yeah, I, I would say I would, it's, it's a views of collection. So, 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 so the collection of past events, uh, Opinions and views on past events. Opinions and view. Okay, fine, no problem. Uh, okay, uh, uh, Adio, can we come to you? Yes, yeah, sure. Um, I um, simply understood it has as that which has happened, and hence I understood. I always understood it as history up until up until the Bijal Mantan um, that um, happened recently, of which I didn't really understand the definition, the new definition. Um, but I, one thing I did get out of that, that it's not history. So I thought it was history, but it clearly isn't. So. Okay, well, what okay. we well, said. Yeah, you might, you might be right. Okay, uh, can we come to Gifty? Gifty, are you with us? Yeah, can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. So Gifty, just give us a quick understanding of, as to what you believe Itiasa it, it, and history is. If any. Uh, I think before I read uh, the professor's uh, piece of writing, I thought history was uh, factual um, and something that we can all learn from. So it's not, I didn't really think of opinions, I just thought past facts um, and you know, history as it is um, and something that we can all learn from. So you thought Itiasa is history? Yes. Okay. Um, Steve, uh, can we come to you next? Can you hear me? Yeah, Steve, you can hear me. I guess the best analogy I could find would be folklore, as in it's not like factual history, but it's a story designed to communicate a message. Okay, wonderful. Do you want to add Me or... Mm -hmm. Yeah, I kind of understood it as um, the past that may or may 
not have literally happened, but it's um, stories that I've told of a past time to um, teach us about how to live the present. Okay, so the past and teach us about the present. Mm-hmm. Okay, and uh, insider. Let me come to you. Insider, are you with us? No? Sagar? Okay, it looks like Sagar can't pick this up. Okay, so so that's interesting. So so obviously all of us seem to have some sort of uh, common thread here in, in, in what our thoughts are about the Ikhtiasa and history. So, Professor, could you just, Balu, could you spend a few minutes? It's a bad habit. Could, could you spend a couple of minutes? And um, take us through, just, just give us a quick recap as to what your core idea of Ikhtiasa is um, and just to some of the key foundational thoughts that, that are underpin it and then we'll go straight into it. Yeah, but perhaps the best thing is to pick up, see, what you have said so far uh, is something like an intuitive understanding, not necessarily of Ikhtiasa, at least of history, let's begin there. See, one of the mo- one thing every historian agrees with, and has been repeated endlessly, as a statement is attributed to every big historian we can think of, which is the following: the only thing we human beings have learned from history is that we don't learn from history. So, in a way, it's a very important thought to think about, in this sense that if history is about the past, in the sense, I'll explain what it means to talk about being in the past, uh, then surely what happened in the past must help us one way or another to know how to live in the present and work towards the future, whatever kind. And every historian, every theologian agrees that history somehow fails to teach. And the only thing it teaches is we don't learn from history. One must ask the question, why is that the case? So to look at history, the way historians do history, the way newspapers write about it, and so on. See, what does it consist of? Pick up any book you feel like. Go and talk to any historian you feel like. This is what it consists of. First, there is something which they call chronology of events. You must understand, chronology does not mean what the word suggests. It comes from the idea of the logos of chronos. Chronos was a god of time and supposed to be the logos in the sense of reason, pattern, structure, logic, however you want to translate it. But when historians or anybody does chronology, what they mean is a calendar. Whether you use a Gregorian calendar, some other calendar, just calendar. It's the first thing. So chronology means calendar. Second, If you look at historical explanations of any kind from anybody in the last, let's say, if you want 2,000 years, last 500 days, you want to talk about modern history, you'll find it consists of either some third-rate psychological explanation of why something happened, or absolutely bankrupt economic theory of why it happened, some kind of third-rate sociological explanation of what it happened, the third read because in all history books or any kind of historical event you care to look at for explanation, that is to understand why something happened, whether why Hitler came to power, why Trump comes to power, why uh, fascism grew in Germany, uh, Nazism grew in Germany, fascism in Italy, Second World War, pick any event you want. Or why did the church act that way in 1200, 1400, whatever, church meaning Catholic church. You'll find there are more or less three very base, one of the three elements. Either it's because they wanted sex, or they wanted money, or they wanted power. Even if these are all true, you see they are not historical explanations in any sense of the word. They are some kind of psychological, sociological explanations about some event in the past. What makes it historical explanation, people? Why is it not psychology? Why is it not sociology? Why is it not psychoanalysis of the past? Why do you want to call it history at all? History is called the queen of social sciences. 
So they say there's a big difference between historical explanation and other explanations. I mean, you must know what historical explanation is, and nobody, trust me, can go check. Nobody knows what it is. Some philosophers have written on it. Basically, it consists of bullshit, a logical structure of an explanation. But we don't know what historical explanations are. So in that sense, if you think you know what history is, you're completely wrong. You don't. You're told that. They're factual. What does it mean? It happened. Yeah, but that doesn't make history, no. I mean, your diary, which is about your past, is not history, is it? What is history? So, your intuitive understanding of history is deficient because you don't know at all what history is. The first thing you must understand, neither philosophy of history nor historical writers can tell you what historical explanation is, how it's different from sociological, political, economic, psychoanalytical, etc., etc., explanations of human existence, of human actions, of human thoughts. It's not even as sophisticated as that. What cognitive science tells you about psychology, you won't learn it from history books at all. So, what is called history, I don't know what is called history, is a collection, literally, of odd things. The only thing that strings them together is a calendar. This happened in this period, next moment, next year, in the same region, next region, this happened. Now, that doesn't tell you anything about the past. So, so, Professor, just to clarify, yeah. just to clarify that, mm -hmm. what you're suggesting is that history is effectively mm -hmm. um, the rationalization of no. events that no. seems to No rationalization. There are no rationalizations at all because there is not a single explanation why Hitler came to power. Which is, let's say, gives us, makes us understand rationally why it happened. Oh, that's because the Germans had this huge problem with the treaty that was imposed on them in the First World War. Now, how the hell do you know that? And nobody knows. I always assume it. Oh, it was nationalism and so on and so forth. The Germans wanted to be a nation. Okay, did you ask the Germans? Did they feel that? Did you have psychological theory where it comes? Oh, nobody knows. No, 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 it's obvious. So, it's a series of ad hoc, literal bullshit which you tell in a cafe, coupled with some mentioning of facts, so to speak, in a calendar. That is history that has been history for the last 500 years. So whatever you want to do, please don't insult science by calling history a science. It's not. It can never be because sciences have certain minimal things. There must be some kind of a theory, there must be certain conditions, some kind of regularity, whether it's a law, probability, whatever, some explanation and so on and so forth. They are completely absent from history. So history has never been is not a science. A queen of sciences, to call it that, only told by people who want to earn their money writing some third rate books and intuitive ideas about history. Now, this is not Balu's idea, this is their idea about themselves. Okay? They say economic, all the Nobel Prize winners call economics a dismal science. Now, we call them sciences, economic science. But they call it dismal, they call it worse than astrology. Not Balu's idea. There is what Nobel Prize laureates in economics tell about economics. History is even worse because they don't give Nobel Prize to history. In so, fact, Professor, are you saying mm -hmm. all these things are, are just narrative? Narrative? My dear fellow, narrative means a story. Now tell me which story is told by, let's say, what do you want to take? Uh, Brexit, maybe it's too early for perhaps, say, the First World War. What narrative is there that you know, which is which you would like to call a narrative? Even children's fairy tale is far more interesting the story they tell. It's not a narrative either. Narrative has a certain structure, has a certain pattern, has a certain flow, has a certain style. So narrative is a form of a textual structure. History doesn't even have that. So what to call history is simply an odd connect, odd collection of all kinds of odd facts strung together with any thesis you feel like sucking out of your thumb which you would not dare say and not laugh out at in a cafe or in a pub. That's history. So if you ask in that sense, what's the difference between history and Itihasa? Itihasa tries to do something entirely different. Namely, can we talk about past in such a way that it helps us to live better today and tomorrow? That's Itihasa. Simplest terms. Now, uh, we'll very soon talk about it in a slightly more a deeper intellectual level, what, what it means to say that. So, Itihasa is not history in this sense. But history 
it, it, that's why, especially with the, since the Second World War, with the so-called postmodernism, it's even gone worse. Because the claim is that there are no patterns, there are no laws, there are no probabilities in history. What one writes is as micro-level description of individual events as possible. That is called scientific history today. So, is that? Yeah. I'm sorry. Yeah, I, 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 there's a cross, con, cross conversation going on. Is anybody saying something? I think the bandwidth is a bit low here. Ah. Bear with me. I'm just going to switch some of these, uh, all the cameras off, all the mics on the mute. But uh, can, can everybody hear this, yes? But guys, I, I if you want to ask a question, what I would suggest you do is just put it up on, 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 on the uh, chat room and you can just uh, let me know you want to ask the question. Just jump in. Okay. So in any case, history as a science, there's a dream that started Giambattista Vico, he started the process of modern history, but there is no science that has never been one, nor will there ever be one. The way they are writing, it's impossible, absolutely impossible, for historical science system, actually. So it doesn't exist. Now, this is a debate I've had, and I have not lost to a single historian, okay? No historian can tell me what's a historical explanation. And what they have written is purely about logical structure of explanation. In fact, the best story comes from a philosopher of science called Carl Hempel. So, that's the 1950s. So, science as a history, or history as science, before you want to call it science in the sense of knowledge, I don't mean by that, don't confuse now with natural sciences, social sciences, human sciences debate, don't bring that here now. If it's knowledge, you are not willing to call everything knowledge, right? A gossip journal is not giving you knowledge. I mean, it might give you some facts about this or that actress, but it doesn't give you knowledge about human beings in the world. So, in that sense, if you want to say these books written by these people over the centuries must give you some knowledge of human beings, it must fulfill certain conditions. It does not fulfill any one of them, not even one. So, what are the conditions? Condition for ex there must be some kind of a theory, there must be an explanatory structure, there must be a relationship between evidence and hypotheses, there must be a, a way of testing the hypothesis, and, and so on. I mean, Understood. yeah. It's not even like elementary arithmetic or, ge or in Euclidean geometry. Forget modern physics, like quantum physics and so on. We don't have to go there. Knowledge of anything has certain things. For example, you say, people in such and such a situation do such and such a thing, even in a cafe, and therefore you did this. Well, you have to discuss about whether it's true, all people do it, some people do it, all the time, and what conditions, in order to accept your understanding, your explanation of an event of an individual. This is minimum condition of knowledge, no? Otherwise, everything yeah. I say is true, everything I say is knowledge. That cannot be the case. Not everybody, not everything you write is physics. Not everything you write is biology. Not everything you do is mathematics. Okay. So, so Professor, I'm, just, I'm, I'm going to stop you there just for two minutes. Yeah. Um, guys, uh, thoughts you want to have and jump in with? Mm -hmm. Go ahead. Uh, yes. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah, I yeah, can. You do. Go ahead. Yeah. So I, I just had a, a quick question. So earlier you, uh, you said that um, so we, we don't usually equate our diaries to, to history. Mm -hmm. um, but by your definition of... of uh, Not my definition, my friend. My definition of historians. By this definition of there effectively being um, a series of facts or uh, activities and then a, a calendar, so some form of chronological chrono chronology. Mm -hmm. um, Call it calendar. It's not chronology. It's not logos of chronos, please. Yeah. Calendar, yeah. Mm -hmm. Would our would our diaries therefore not become history? So what 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 is it that makes uh, that prevents our diaries becoming that history? Oh, today nothing except for example, if a historian takes up a diary, Hitler's diary and Frank's diary, it's called history. Yeah. So if somebody writes, I never wrote a diary, but somebody discovers a diary, writes about it, if we become famous, that's history. You buy it seriously. Okay, so, okay. so it, is upon that, it is upon that moment that somebody picks it up and, and reads it, maybe has an opinion on it. The it, what opinion? What opi I really, for, I, I, take, you, you are from England, right? You are this Cambridge there, University of Cambridge, you know, the Doyen. What's that idiot's name? Quinton Skinner. 
two volumes foundations of modern political thought history kindly read it tell me what explanation is there what does he under of anything not one single understanding of any event Literally, for example, he talks about a huge problem within Catholic Church, that the movement of the church, theology. Half a sentence. Oh, this Pope was obsessed with power. <laughs> Come on. Explanation. Historical explanation. He's a doyen. Yeah, you must understand what kind of people there are when he becomes a doyen. What kind of intelligence there is. So, histo there, so there is no history, people. So there is no history. There is only... So yeah. Is that the way you're trying to tell us here is that actually um, you're almost, you are saying that there is no history. Oh, the word exists. There are any number of books called the history textbooks. There are PhDs, there are masters. Yeah, yeah, yeah sure. There's no sort of knowledge hmm. base. There's not knowledge that. It's not knowledge at all. There's simply gossips and some events put together in a uh, calendar. And what connects these events to each other? There is any bullshit you want to suck out of your thumb. That's all. Any okay. bullshit. So if, if I had to do a caricature, if I had to do a caricature of your statement or yeah. your view, yeah. is that not my view? Is, it's their view, not my view. They are themselves. Okay, okay. okay. Mm. History is mm -hmm. uh, effectively um, just opinions and uh, no. uh, composition the, thoughts. Look, you can't even call it opinion. No, wait a minute. Unless you want to call it this, uh, your prime minister may. She is an absolute ass. Mm -hmm. In a, it's an opinion, yes. Knowledge? Do you want to call it that? No. So exactly. All right. That's the, the level. level. That's the level. That's the level. Absolutely the level. Only thing is, all I have to do to write history of your Brexit, of your conservatives, of Margaret Thatcher, and anybody you want, collect the bloody events, put them in a calendar, and tell some story about frustration Margaret Thatcher had for being the daughter of some bloody grosses somewhere and so on. Oh, that's history of Margaret Thatcher, history of Britain. That's the story they're telling you. Come on, this is worse than this is worse than daily daily the daily pick. Yeah. Prior to prior to you writing about it, or prior to you picking up mm -hmm. these series of events, mm -hmm. um, it is not classified as history. It's not what sorry. It's not classified as history yeah. prior to somebody writing about it. Is yeah. that what we're saying? No, no, it's picked up as, if you mean by that a past event, yeah, but is it part of his historian study? No. Historiography, see, history is a name for what the historiographers write. Historiography, graphene of historia, okay? So it's a writing of that. That's historiography. That's what we call history textbooks. So when you use the word history, we are talking only about historiography. A way of writing about past. So That's interesting. So That's you, very clear. Look, You're saying it's the yeah. way of thinking about the past. Yeah. It's very simple. You just any you are, you go to go to tomorrow, tomorrow to Cambridge Oxford, ask the best historian you can find. Ask him to tell me how, for example, you can ask a simple question. Look, we have a huge problem now in the Middle East, eh? in Syria, Iraq, and so on. All right, uh, so there's a war going on. So please tell us, why do wars start and what do we do about it? I'll tell you what he's going to tell you. This is very complex. There are multiple factors. And he will give you one bloody wash list of 100 items or more. Could be all true, sir. What is the connection between these events? He won't be able to answer. So what a historical explanation is he giving? It won't be, tell you what to do with the Middle East. And you had how many wars in human history? How many have been studied so far? Do that and experiment yourself. So you want to know whether the history or not as a science, ask the question. Any question you feel like. Yeah. Why did and, and, and so the uh, strong statement you make here is that history is clearly not science in any any sense of the word. Um, anybody else want to come in here at this point? We've now got uh, Kishan Shikotra Prakash Shah joining us as well. So, uh -huh. any of you guys want to join in? Any thoughts at this point about history? Look, uh, uh, make a prediction. You can check it ten years down the line, maybe fifteen years. Uh, today, the, explaining Trump, it's to do with the white trash, right? Brexit is a question of frustrated unemployed people, right? 
15 years down the line, they'll pr tell you that with all kinds of facts about the voice traps uh, from in America, the Rust Belt, the Orange Belt, the Bible Belt, their denominations, all these facts they will assemble and they'll tell you it's basically the white trash doing it. Frustrated uh, British people, 60% of them, Brexit. They won't tell you anything more than that. They haven't told you anything more than that. 15 years down the line that you're going to be taught and published and get prizes for history writing. Sure, sure. No, no, okay, no, I understand that. And, and maybe 15 years time I might hold you to it. <laughs> um, to just, uh, is there anybody else here who wants to jump in before we, because I, I want to now get uh, Baba Balu to really go into Ikiasa. Yeah. So, he, um, so, so before we do that, though, I just want to wrap up, not wrap up, but just maybe yeah. make sure everybody's with us. Yeah. Uh, so, Guilty? Steve? When you, when you say there's um, nothing that can be learned from these historical facts about like the, um, the oppression of these white people, the one they were feeling that they like, spreads it, mm -hmm. is there not things that we can learn from that that will teach us how to not let it happen again? Oh, of course there is, oh, because th th there are two different questions, no? One is, can we learn from, from how people act, behave before us during our time? The answer is absolutely yes. That's the only thing that can help us to find out what mistakes we've committed and why, so as not to commit those mistakes again and again and again. So there's a second question. Do books on history, historiography, help us in this quest? Well, if there is one such book, my dear, I haven't come across it, neither has any historian in the last 400 years, right even in the past. Is your question answered? So there, if I could just um, maybe a bit of clarity there. Mm -hmm. So effectively what you're saying there, Balu, is you're saying that historians are writing these history books, mm -hmm. but they, they are kind of trying to comment, commentate, they're writing commentaries here without any real guidance for the future, without any real key, you know, key points of uh, learning. Yes, but, for, uh, yeah, but there's something more you have to add. You're giving them a dignity. You think they are commenting. No, they are not. They are bullshitting. <laughs> right? So if you tell me, what are historians doing? They are bullshitting. What is history? They sell that to you as science. That's history. Bullshit sold as science is history. You want a definition okay. of history? That's it. Not how, Balu not how Balu defines it, people. Please understand that. That is history as okay. they themselves define it. Understood. Okay, so so um, um, uh, if, if, if there's nobody else that wants to come in at this point, mm -hmm. um, I'd like to move on to Itiasa mm -hmm. specifically, mm -hmm. um, and maybe uh, uh, Balu, if, if you can give us a couple of minutes and, and tell us Itiasa okay. from, from from the Afamar tradition. Well, yeah, but let me pick up this question and bring you to Itiasa. The, I forget who asked the question, okay. but uh, yeah, about whether we can learn from the past or present and is it important? Uh, I said yes. Well, if you say yes, which is what Indian traditions have done for a thousand years, then you have to talk about past in terms of things we recognize today in ourselves. The way we live, the way we eat, the way we relate, the way we experience emotions, and etc., etc. See what kind of problems have occurred in the past and how we can avoid the miseries and the pains that have resulted from these mistakes. This is the fundamental focus of Itihasa. That is what they started writing. It's a tradition which is dead now for lots of thousands of years for various reasons. I won't go into it now. So Itihasa tradition was an attempt to tackle the question, namely, can we become better by thinking about the past. If you see the answer is yes, there is Itihasa. Let me give you how they just give you a very intriguing indication of the route they have taken to tackle this problem. Just one one thread that pick out. You see, first let me begin with common sense. All, all of us in India, Africa, Europe, in all European languages that I know, including Greek and Latin and so on. See, we say things like the following. Time heals. Time will bring wisdom. Time will teach. And so on and so forth. Yeah? 
which means when we talk about time, all of us, we attribute all kinds of role to time. Yeah, it teaches you, it heals you, it cures you, and so on and so forth. It's a common sense talk, right? Point is, it's present in all cultures, in all times, in all languages. Okay. Now, the intriguing question then is, of course, how can time do any of these things? But Indians took this question very seriously, contrasted to Europe. Uh, Europe today, even, even all of us, <laughs> when we talk, to us time is some kind of a vague inert reference point, which doesn't do anything, that, except to function in a calendar. Yeah, Space does something more. For example, you're living in a three-dimensional space. If three-dimension becomes two-dimension, our bodies are going to undergo tremendous changes. The where we are living in and is going to have tremendous changes. So change in space creates huge changes in our world. Now space, is, space and time are two fundamental things according to modern physics. What a, what, in whatever sense they understand it, quantum physics, Einstein and theory of relativity, forget all that. So if space changes, literally our world changes. But time obviously when it changes, does not, nothing happens, right? Because calendar, no. It is supposed to be linear, goes in one direction, some bloody bullshit like that, we repeat. Isn't it amazing? On the one hand, all of us are convinced. Hey, don't worry, time will heal the wounds. Hey, don't worry, this time you, time will teach you, and so on and so on. Yet, history, which is supposed to be about time after all, tells you time doesn't do shit. It's a calendar. Now, there's something wrong with it, either with all of us, human beings, over the last four or five thousand years, in our daily languages even today, best scientists talk this way. But yeah, a history tells you it's simply a calendar, it doesn't do anything. But space is apparently does all kinds of weird and odd things. No? Well, Indians raise this, taking this thread, only this thread, they raise the question of what role does time play in human history, human experience, they called it Kala. So we developed multiple notions, Kala Guna, Kala Dharma. So our Itihasa was structured in terms of how do you categorize Kala, its impact on human beings and its changes, and they are the fundamental threats of Indian Itihasa. So time is extremely important, past is extremely important, but because they play a role in human life and also in physics, space-time, yeah, 4,000 years ago we started focusing and trying to understand time. Even the Vishwarupa Darshana, if you know about Indian traditions, what for example Krishna is supposed to have done in the Mahabharata war in Kurukshetra, he always appears in the form of Kala as time. So the important role that time plays, which all of us recognize, take the simple, simple experience, bio, biology. You take an old banana, you take an unripe banana, put it there. Time ripens it. Of course there are biological processes, nobody denies it. But it, is only, it ripens only in time. That is, if time played no role at all, it could not ripen at all. No biologist, no chemist ever would challenge this. Hasn't, haven't challenged this. But yet, studying about human past, time plays no role. This is not possible, people. So Indians took these questions up. Itihasa, in really, in the best sense of the word, scientific, attempt to scientifically understand, help human beings in the present towards the future by reflecting about the past in particular ways. Excellent. So, so let me just um, catch up and, and hopefully give everybody else a few moments to catch up with what you've said. Mm -hmm. um, you, 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 okay, so I, I completely am with you up to the point of time. Mm -hmm. And, and, and um, Ityasa is the Indian attempt, mm -hmm. and I'm just going to paraphrase, mm -hmm. that is the Indian attempt at um, from the present trying to understand the past to build a better future. 
and to live but, a better present as well. Yeah, mm-hmm. and and to live a better present. Now, now. So, so if we were to take something like the Ramayana, which is considered an ityas, mm-hmm. so the most basic question we want to start with is, is Ramayana an ityas? Mm-hmm. Ityas, the way you're... Oh, yes, it is. And so, if so, how is it so? <laughs> uh, let me give a very general answer, because to give, go, to answer it any depth, we have to go to multiple facets. Uh, but the most abstract, I'll give you kind of how do you say, two sentence sketch of a process. You see, in Indian traditions, if you look at last three, four thousand, four thousand years, let's say, uh, perhaps you've heard of this word uh, about uh, reaching enlightenment or being happy or finding ananda. How you have heard it is that there is a root called jnana mark. You've heard of it, I hope. Yes. Gyanamarga, as the word says, is a root that tries to find that enlightenment, uh, Brahma, or whatever you want to call it, through the root of knowledge. Okay? Knowledge is the best sense of the word. That jnana, the jnana with us is literally identical to what today we could identify as the best theories in natural sciences. Their notion of knowledge. In fact, our notion of knowledge is much better than that. But it's minimally that. So, Jnana Marga was that root. Yeah. Now, uh, I'm not saying this is how it happened, but I'm putting it as though it happened. Now, see, this Jnana Marga, for example, you want to learn the universe through, let's say, astrophysics, cosmo- scientific cosmology, or quantum physics. Not everybody can be a physicist. Not everybody does physics. Not everybody does physics is able to understand quantum physics and so on and so forth. Most of the people don't do physics at that level. They're interested in other things, other talents, from engineering to architecture to drama, poetry and so on. All kinds of people are there in the world. Now, so if you follow the Jnana Marga and you have knowledge about what, what, or how it is to become happy, find Ananda, Brahma, whatever, there is a following fundamental question. Namely, how do we Get this knowledge across. Don't confuse it popularization. It's not. How do we get this knowledge across to those who cannot follow the Jnana Mark? That is, how can we teach help, teach that knowledge of highest level of quantum physics to an ordinary peasant who doesn't know anything about vector analysis, vector algebra, forget the rest of high level mathematics, so that he or she can use it this is a question. Indian, I'm not saying somebody sat there and discussed it and decided it. It's a very, very complex thing that happened there, I think. The answer to India, Indian answer to that was this. Itihasa is how we are going to reach ordinary people. That is, that knowledge, unadulterated, with this extraordinary sophistication, will be taught in such a way that the most, I'll give you an example of it very soon, that the most difficult, most abstruse philosophical, theoretical, scientific concepts becomes part of daily life of the most illiterate peasant you can think of. Only then, and only then, does knowledge serve the purpose it is meant to, namely, help all the people in the world. It might sound stupid what I'm saying, it's not, I'll just give you one example of how, how they did it. That is Itihasa. Itihasa is an attempt to transmit, not popularize, I repeat again, knowledge acquired at the highest level in a way that is completely accessible and useful to someone who cannot, for whatever reason, follow the Gamma. Let me give you an example of what it means. You see, there is a question, uh, probably you have been asked in Britain, I have been asked a number of times, it's a problem that all NRIs face in America, especially in our children, in the question is this, why are your gods so grotesque, four arms, ten heads, twenty feet tongue, and just think of Kali, or Ganesha, why are they grotesque? Now, they're always embarrassed, all kinds of bullshit answers are given from saying, for example, I heard these answers given, oh, yeah, that's a notion of beauty. And I was there in one such conference, and Ganesha and Kali were there in the conference. 
Uh, yeah, that's our aesthetic notions, that somebody said. Some, of course, well-read, educated, cultivated Indian. And a lot of uh, Americans joined us to agree with that. So I said, I want to ask you a question. Tell me, which person in India would look at somebody like Ganesha and say, Oh, what a beautiful person, I want him to be my son-in-law. <laughs> which person will look at Kali and say, Oh my God, what a beautiful, the I wanted her to be my daughter or my daughter-in-law. No Indian would say that, people. They are ugly. That's not a sense of beauty at all. Now, don't get angry. I'll take you in a more interesting direction. Question. Uh, why is it, and it's true, we must accept that to understand the beauty of the answer. Why is it all our gods, call them gods for the moment, are devas, whether it is Brahma or Mariamma in some temple in a village, all are grotesque. Shiva, to cite our American and European friends, is a phallus, inverted phallus, actually. Why do we, hell do we do that? Surely we had brilliant artists. Surely we would have Krishna is described as one of the most beautiful persons in terms of beauty. Blue skin, four arms, beautiful. Suppose you had a, such a child, would you call him beautiful? Possibly not. Impossible, I think. All right. Why is it? We did not do what say Michelangelo did, did, what Leonardo da Vinci did. Why can we not have these beautiful Adonis gods, muscular gods, fantastically beautiful women as our devis? Why? This is a question you should ask very seriously. Now I'll give you a fragment, I'll give you an answer, you'll only understand a fragment of it. You see, in India we use this word para, very much, paramatma, parabrahma, uh, Parantapa and so on and so forth. Para is extremely important to us. Para is something that is not iha. Iha meaning, let's call this the world, this reality. A para is something that's not that. Para is a different from iha, not the opposite of iha, different from iha. Now, there is something very strange about this notion of para. This is where the problem of Christian, uh, all the three religions get, getting stuck in, which they have not been able to solve, this is a huge problem. If para is, uh, iha, you must understand iha as the world, everything that exists, the world meaning everything that was, is and shall be. To Indians, there is nothing outside of the world. To the three uh, Semitic religions, there is because God is outside the world. Now. So Indians, whether it's Buddhists, giants, so-called Hindus, whatever, the only thing that exists is this, the world. Para is indeed not Iha. Iha is everything there is. That's a Vishwa. Vishwa is Iha. Para plays an extraordinarily important role to us. On the one hand, it does not exist in Iha. But one thing that no Indian tradition has ever accepted is because if the only thing that exists is Iha, you can only be happy in Iha. Anything you access must be in Iha, in this Vishwa, otherwise you can't access it because there's nothing outside it. So in some senses, Para has to be, in some senses, not exist, in some senses Para has to be accessible in Iha, in this Vishwa. Otherwise, sorry. I'm sorry. So, uh, Palu, Palu, just quickly, yeah. tell me about para. Para is... Uh, but at the moment, keep it a bit, I'll, I'll bring it, but I'll keep it a bit vague. It's, it's a very deep philosophical conception, but keep it a little bit vague. Para is, that is Parabrahma, Paramatma, Paramananda, it's all to do with para. Para is not Iha. Iha is the world, the Vishwa. Everything that is, was and shall be. That's, that's Vishwa, that's Iha. Okay? And this is where we live. All your lokas are in this world. All the lokas. So it's Brahma Loka, Vishnu Loka, Path. Everything is in Ishwa, in this Iha. It's not outside. Doesn't exist. There's nothing outside the world for India. Never was there that. Now, if we have to find, so to speak, our gods in, uh, assume you are seeking that. You want Parabrahma, you want Paramatma, you want Paramananda. All these things you have to find it in Iha. But para is not part of iha. It's not an object in iha. That is, 
whatever that Parabrahma is, he is not this ashtray, he is not something like this ashtray standing there. He is not an object. Paramatma is not an object. It is not inert. It is not, they are all in the world. But if they are somehow not accessible in this world, well, there is no way you can find Paramatma, Paramananda, Parabrahma. Because is a, this is the early world we know, everything must be accessible here. Alright, keep that in mind. Now, I will show you the beauty. In that case, let's for a moment say our devas are something like gods. Something to do with the para. Alright? But para is not iha. Don't confuse them with existing objects, whether in terms of energy, matter, laws, nothing. How then do you conceive them? Philosophically, para, we can define it and so on, develop a theory about it, which Indians have. But, maybe first one, sorry, first more, the beautiful shloka in Gita, I'm not sure, third chapter, fourth chapter, I'm not sure where it comes. I think it's the fourth or fifth, or even the fifth chapter. Vishaya vinivirtante nirahara dehinaha. Rasavarjim rasopisya param drishtva nivartate. Meaning the following. When indriyas are, are withdrawn from the vishayas, the themes which attract them, all these, five, let's say, five sense organs with respect to sense objects, even when they leave the body, nirahara dehina, in a body which doesn't take any food, rasavarjim, they leave rasa behind. Param drishtva. If you are able to see the para, even the rasa will disappear. Just give me I gave you hundreds of such citations. This is beautiful citation because param, that is what darshana of para does to you, seeing para does to you. Uh, this is one of the ideas of uh, uh, enlightenment and so on, a crucial idea. Okay. So, in that sense, para yes, is very. Pardon? Yeah. Can I, can I pause you just for a few minutes? Yeah. Um, uh, everybody else, uh, do you want to just jump in and ask a few questions for clarity? No, wait, let, let me finish the thing about the Itihasa. Oh, okay. Round it off, round it off. Okay. Like, okay. Yeah. Now I won't go into para. So now, so para is very important, it's very crucial, but does, it's not an existing thing in the world. How do you get this idea across to everybody? Well, those are images, so called images of gods. Such an object, on the one hand, is very recognizable. Something to do with human beings. But such an object could never exist. Four arms, fifty heads, eight heads, four heads. Prahlada's story is a beautiful illustration of that with Hiranyakashipu. He is a Brahma is everywhere. Is he here? says Hiranyakashipu. Yes. In this pillar. Yes, in this pillar. Breaks it open. What has come out? Narasimha. Half man, half lion. Impossible creature, biologically. Cannot exist. But that is exactly what para is. Accessible does not exist. This is a very deeply, very difficult philosophical conception to understand. Itihasa transmits it this way to the most illiterate person in India. That is what Itihasa does. Transmit knowledge, not popularize it. So, our so-called grotesque gods are not images of gods. To say that we are doing image worship and idolatry, people are idiots. They don't, our gods do not look that way, that's not para at all. But there's the only way, or perhaps the best way, the most efficient way, not to lose the sophistication of the idea because it's very important to think in it that way. But, retain it in Iha. Those are our gods, people. That is what Itihasa has done. Teach physics, most sophisticated physics. Without diluting it, without popularizing the most illiterate person in the city the city has. All right. Thank you very much. Such well, thank you very much. That's very, very striking indeed. Um, I want to bring in uh, people here yeah. um, to ask uh, some clarity questions, yeah. even challenges. Oh, sure. Uh, so, so um, anybody want to start? Uh, can you hear me? I can hear yeah. you. I know. Yeah, um, so basically, I think, is the issue with the way people understand history, 
is that the problem here? Because see, obviously you define history in one way, the term, mm -hmm. um, and when at the beginning we were asked what we thought of itihasa, mm -hmm. or said it's something that we can learn from, mm -hmm. which is something that you summed up now, mm -hmm. but. So what I'm trying to understand is, is it the word history that, and the way people perceive it that we have a problem with? Uh, no, history, no, I'm not saying, the US word history, all of us, they are really, and if you ask, you go to the etymology of the word, comes from historia, what does it mean and so on. But it's a word which really doesn't tell us anything about the past, which is what history was supposed to be about. Uh, para tries to look at the past in ways, in forms, in fashions, which does precisely that, namely help us. So history as a word is actually a meaningless term today. It has been for the last 400 years. Historiography is writing about nothing, which is exactly what his history books are about. We don't know a single thing about human past, no regularity, no structure, no laws, nothing. All right, if that's the case, we can go around murdering each other, which is what we're doing happily all the time. So, and, and I think that's the, that's the point that I want to elaborate, and maybe um, so people can jump in on this. Mm -hmm. What you effectively, the, the, the dichotomy there that you're, you're beginning to show us is that what you're saying is that history on the one hand mm -hmm. is um, uh, effectively, um, it's completely impotent in changing human society. And Ikhtiyasana mm -hmm. is something which um, takes the most deepest concepts mm -hmm. um, to the layman and in, in, in how to improve their here and now. Mm -hmm. Effectively, how to change human society for the better. Yeah, individuals, not society, individuals. So, mm -hmm. in, in many ways, are we likening Ikhtiyasana to fables? So, my question is, do Ikhtiyasana do they have to have existed in the past? Itihasa existing in the past, what do you mean? Itihasa is, tries to describe the past. Yeah, no, no, wait. Itihasa tries to describe the past away for the, exactly the same reason why people wanted to write history even in the West. So, well, clearly not. So here, the problem is this, my friend. History here also began with the same goal. Let's understand human past so that it helps us for today and tomorrow. All right? That 2,000 years ago when Greeks started writing, that was their goal. 400 years ago, so-called scientific history began. The different people had different uh, figures to identify it. I think Jim Battista Vico was the best one on the idea of human history. I think the first book which tried to begin this history. Lord Acton is the most famous man, historian, who said one thing that human beings have learned from history is that human beings do not learn from history. Now, if history is written to help us, and if what is written does not help us in any way to supposed to help us, logically I have two options. Either human beings cannot learn anything from the past, or history is not at all what history is supposed to be. Choice is yours. So. And of course, Itihasa, they call it fable and so on. They will be Christian shit about us. Okay, so, so just, just to clarify for on Yojo's point there, mm -hmm. uh, he, he used the word fable. Mm -hmm. Okay, mm -hmm. now I think on this basis, I think we will both agree that Itihasa is not fables. No, 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 let's ask the question. Uh, uh, fables, when they give an example of a fable, is Aesop's fables. We do have such fables. It's called Panchatantra. Now, nobody can say that Gita, uh, not Gita, uh, uh, Ramayana, Mahabharata, Puranas, are like Aesop's fables, no? So whatever they are, if the fable, ha the word has to mean anything, it cannot be applied to Itihasa. Maybe Itihasa might be something else, okay? But definitely it cannot be fables. If, fa if Aesop's fable is an example of what fables are, then Itihasa can never be a fable. You can't use the word. So I suppose my, my question is mm -hmm. that what is what is it that it effectively separates the word fable from itihas? So what is it that will that differentiates the two words? Uh, it's like asking the question: What's the difference between Panchatantra and Ramayana? Is that the question you're asking? Yes. Uh, what kind of an answer do you want? All right. 
For instance, uh, Aesop's fable, tell you a story, tell you a moral of a story. Hmm? No Purana ever tells you one story and say moral of the story is to give you a very, very silly contrast. So, nothing in the style of the structure, if you look at it as a text, style of the discourse, if you look at it as discourse, in the language it's used, you use the language. In the content, if you look at the content, is it possible to say Aesop's fable is equal to Ramayana Mahabharata Purana? Therefore, whatever else Itihasa might be, it cannot be fable because fable picks out a particular kind of genre, a literary text of a particular type. Fine, but under under the, um, they would both be tied under this uh, this banner of effectively tools that are used to teach. Sorry, come again. I missed you. What's your question? So they would both be tied under this banner mm -hmm. of tools that are if, that are used to teach. Uh huh. Okay. Well, if you want to use a word, then physics is also a fable, isn't it? So is mathematics. They are tools to teach, aren't they? Everything is a tool to teach. Well, that is true. Except what is called history. It is not a tool to teach at all. So, therefore, whatever history is, it is not a tool to teach. These are logical conclusions. You don't need deep analysis for that. Purely logic. Yeah. yeah. Um, um, you mean you describe para as accessible, mm -hmm. yet will never exist? Para doesn't oh, exist, my, yeah. Para doesn't exist. Correctly. Mm -hmm. yes, but you were saying that it's about gods, like um, next, um, the Prelad story, yeah. that um, the half man, half god will never exist. Yeah. But what about Ika? Because what about? he's Buddha, Gautam Buddha. Yeah, what about him? He would, I guess you wouldn't. Oh, he existed, he's I suppose, absolutely, yeah. I he think looks so. like mm -hmm. an average person. Yeah, absolutely. He, he was an average person. Yeah. Um, so yeah. not like Shiva or Kali. Uh, uh, n not that kind of a figure. Buddha was not like that, no. Neither was Shankaracharya, yeah. Right. They're all people like you and me, yeah. Maybe more exceptional, maybe not. That depends on assessments. Yes, there are people like you and me. But in some senses, Krishna, Krishna, see, he, Language is extremely important. Krishna is an is an apara avatara of Vishnu. Apara avatara. He is apara. That is, he is not para. It's an avatara in the in an apara. That's Krishna. So the avataras of Vishnu, the so-called ten avataras, they are apara avataras. Apara. A is negation in Sanskrit. Negation of the word para. So, uh, but uh, that I took as one element. So, what to do in Itihas just to complete? To help you understand the past. Of course, there are all kinds of references to kings, events, etc. in the past. But they play a very strict role. They're organized in a very strict way. With respect to one element I took, Kala, with respect to time. They organized events, tell it in a certain way, so that the fundamental goal of all history writing even in Europe, gets fulfilled, namely, help us. Very that's, that's very, very wonderful and interesting, actually. Um, I just want to bring uh, other people in. Um, any other questions, any other clarification? We're coming to the end of our study group. Yeah. Um, I know we spent a few minutes late, so I, I will go until 10 past. Mm -hmm. um, are there any other questions to ask? Sagar? Prakash Bhai, Ishan, well, Balu, you've clearly put them all to sleep. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God, people. I thought I was, I was captivating and charming. Okay. Maybe it's because of my smoking. I shouldn't have smoked. Put, put on some shawl and, and all this, you know, uh, religious symbols and some Rudrakshi. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm too much in, in Yiha, so... I don't know. No, please, I mean, so, please think so about it. Please think um, about it. Uh, what I will do is I, I will I will just wrap this up for us. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think this was a, a, a just a we were just scratching the surface yes, here, literally. Yeah. And, I mean, we, we didn't t touch on language. We didn't touch on the um, some of the the, the problems of the social sciences. As, as you, you, you <laughs> I know. Have, I'm well. sorry. I'm sorry. I should have picked it. Yeah, but we mm. follow this on in the future. Mm -hmm. um, oh, in fact, I think. Uh, 
Prakash Bhai wants to ask something. Prakash Bhai, can, can you hear us? Uh, Balu Pranam. <laughs> Very nice <laughs> to see you again. <laughs> Hello, Prakash. Uh, Yes, I, I had just one quick question because this is a repeated uh, question that uh, is posed within uh, your research program, yeah. uh, which is why why is it that the the European approach, mm -hmm. uh, which you could say is exemplified in uh, in the study of history, mm -hmm. uh, appealed so much to Indian intellectuals uh, uh, yeah. over uh, since the colonial period? Mm -hmm. Um, do you, can you offer uh, makings of some kind of uh, answer or response to that? I mean, or insight. Uh, you, you know, I mean, obviously, you, in the in the latter part of your paper, you talk about Sankarivar and mm -hmm. their attempts to emulate, uh, you know, the kind of historiography that the Europeans have produced, mm -hmm. and uh, as a result, are going very ori and detaching and at the risk of potentially destroying the Indian traditions. Mm -hmm. um, what, what, what has gone wrong with, with, with us and, and, and our intellectuals? In, uh, in, and you have to answer that in about five minutes. <laughs> <laughs> so there's your PhD in five minutes. Off you go. <laughs> Prakash, can you not have simpler questions than that? Okay. <laughs> Uh, oh, listen, oh, Jesus, there's, there's too much to say. Uh, let's see. Uh, I'll pick up two, three elements. Uh, let me begin with your last element, uh, about Sang Parivar and so. Uh, let me just give you an indication of what I mean when I say damage. You see, if you start discussing whether Rama uh, existed, whether Ayodhya existed, whether Rama Sehitu existed and so on, see, there are two aspects to it. People like me, who are brought up in these stories, is an absolute thrill to go to Kurukshetra and say, oh my God, they were here and so on. Mm. Okay. Well, forget the thrill. It's beautiful. It's fantastic. Yeah. Oh, you know, Gokula, that's where Krishna was. Oh my God. And so on. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but go to the next generation, subsequent generation. What's going to happen? Discussion is about whether this guy existed there or not. So the whole idea of what Krishna is, what the role he's supposed to play, what Itihasa taught us, to look at para completely disappears. It becomes like a discussion about whether this building existed, that individual existed, and so on. So the idea of para goes away. What that the thousands of years to build, you destroy. You destroy that. It's not because it's Indian culture. This is one of the most fantastic ways that's open to humankind to be happy, to access happiness, not just to this other person, everybody on, on the planet, if you could put it properly, you're going to destroy that resource once and forever. What are you going to replace it with? Then the second element of the answer. Is it common to the studies of Indian religions, not just Indian, all Indian religions, no exceptions, is this. When you study Indian religions, they always study it as some kind of sociological phenomena. There were these gods, and then came popular gods, and there were new gods came in. So they're all human creations, and they come, they somehow did it, took over the people's imagination, power, whatever it is. So they are all human creations. Now, there's nothing wrong with it. Except this is not the way they talk about either Jesus, or Moses, or Yahweh, and so on. In the Jewish religion, uh, the discussion that God is supposed to have had with Moshe, uh, Moses and Mount Sinai, they are supposed to be historical facts. It's not created by anybody. Christian God is not a creation of anybody. Jesus' discussion is whether or not he is a manifestation, revelation of God or not. All Indian religions are always creation of this priesthood, that group, this sociological phenomenon and so on. So, there's the only framework we have today. The only framework within which people function, intellectuals, of all shades, all colors. So, if you make, destroy what these devas are supposed to be, what roles they have played, replace them with individuals, it gets, it's going to get fused with this sociological approach. So, maximally what you can say, all Indian religions are basically fantasies of people. And you know what people, there is Jesus, there is Moses, there is Yahweh, there is Muhammad, there is Allah. The rest, 
Ah, they are all popularizing popular religions. This is a route you're going to take. You have no other choice intellectually. Then, uh, other element. Why are we attracted? Uh, again, there are multiple elements. I'll give you two of them. One. Look at two minutes. Yeah, okay. I'll do it in 30 seconds if you want. But then you won't understand it. So, uh, when you talk and write this way, this is a problem with JNU, DU, all these historians. You see, you get invited to conferences, you go to five star hotels, you travel around, you know, almost recognition. Except when they want to employ, to employ you in the universities, they don't get employed. They all stay in JNU, DU. They don't want them in Columbia, they don't want them in Harvard, they don't want them in Princeton. But you get invited. That's fantastic. They have a beautiful living to make. Second reason, the other side of the same coin. When you don't know what you're doing, and you don't understand it. It is simply bullshit. Like for example, let me give you one example. Uh, this woman, what's her name? This famous queen from JNU. It's Romila Thapar. Yeah. She is talking about Itihasas. And she says, she takes Skanda Prana, I think, yeah. To show that it is some kind of a bumshawal, it is some kind of a heraldry. In my story, I say, Puranas are one of the ways of illustrating these Adhyatma ideas. It must be interesting for you to know that the three Acharyas, especially the Madhva Acharya and Ramanuja Acharya, constantly make use of Puranas to interpret Upanishads. It's not a Vamashavari at all. It played a different role in the Indian traditions. So if you don't understand that, you can't understand Puranas. You can't, if you don't understand the uh, Adhyatma. So you can therefore talk about anything. A third element, anything trivial, uh, today's history. And that's what history, uh, most of the PhDs have seen, at least about 20% of the PhDs I have seen uh, are, are from history. They are about history of Kalapur Chappals. Now they get PhDs. So you can write all kinds of nonsense about anything you feel like a historian. It's an easy way to make a living. And there is another problem. On the other side, this is a trivial answer. The deeper answer, a problem with what I call colonial consciousness. We believe that the West has science, which it does have natural sciences. They are superior, they have knowledge. So whatever they say, therefore, must be true. And this is what they say about India, this is what they say about history, therefore, it must be true. We do it. So there are many, many answers, Prakash, uh, and uh, my minutes are up. Mm -hmm. So, yes. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. I thought it was, uh, it was, it was a very interesting and and. and we can go on uh, discussing this. Look, I, I think I'd like to su summarize this, and I know um, it's it's just gone past our time limit. Um, everybody, the uh, if it's okay with you, um, what I will do is I will try and put together mm -hmm. a summary of what we discussed over maybe a page or two pages. Mm -hmm. uh, I'll run it by you, then I'll circulate it around to everybody. Mm -hmm. And I think what we need to do mm -hmm. is in, wider, in the wider community, I urge all of you to engage Balu directly, but also um, when we release this paper, uh, which maybe sums up very, in a very concise manner, history uh, as, uh, you know, vis-a-vis -vis Itiasa, um, that we popularize this amongst our own people, um, amongst the people within the tradition, mm -hmm. so that they can understand Ramayana, Mahabharat, and the other Itiasas much, much, in a much more coherent manner. Mm -hmm. So I, I think this study group is a small attempt or a small start, a small contribution to that mm -hmm. wider aim. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, I'd encourage everybody who joined in today. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. But this is the beginning of our journey. Mm -hmm. may, um, may, I said, yeah. like to engage Balu again. May, may just one sentence to thank all of you. Thank you very much for listening. Uh, some of you might be offended, but please don't get offended. Uh, but try and think about some of these things. You don't have to accept what I'm saying, reject it. But with good reason, good criticism, reject it. But please think about this. Because the route we are following today, whether here or there, is catastrophe, not just for India, but for all of us as humankind. Thank you very much for listening to me. Wonderful, Balu. Thank you very, very much. I really appreciate that. Uh, everybody, uh, that's the end of our first study group. We'll hopefully have many more. Um, and I hope you will all join join us and continue, continue to support the Jarmanthan. We will certainly be engaging Balu uh, a, a lot more as well and, and uh, get his thoughts and get, penetrate further and further in. But I think, uh, I repeat my point, I think what we'll do off the back of this is to produce a short paper 
and that paper will be circulated. And I suggest that we begin to articulate ourselves better when it comes to Ikhyasa and history and so on and so forth. Um, and um, I think I will end it with that. So thank you very much, everybody. Uh, we can all start logging off. Um, I wish you well. Um, and let's all uh, keep it.